thank you. It's a, a great pleasure for us to receive you uh, uh, here in our court. We are very interested to establish some kind of relationship with all the uh, civil society and the uh, university system of Argentina and also abroad. Um, we are also very interested in establish links with all the people who are interested in, in politics and institutions. And, and I think it's, it's very interesting also to discuss and to hear your, your questions. I am very open to, to discuss with you whatever you want. Yeah. Okay? Who is the first? Well, I don't know, maybe if, if you... Uh, Give us a little bit of the history of the court and how it's uh, changed over the past uh, two decades. Uh, I first visited uh, Argentina in the early 90s when President Menem was president. And uh, they've heard a little bit about the history of you know, the changing uh, composition of the court. But perhaps you could say a little bit about you know, how you got to your position and, and the current composition of the court and, and how that's evolved. Okay, um, perhaps it's, uh, it's important to say that our constitution is very similar to the US constitution. We have the same constitutional device and the judicial branch is very similar. We have a Supreme Court with federal judges we, we have several judges, lower courts, and we also have state courts. So our Supreme Court received all the petitions from all the countries, but we have a certiorari. This is the possibility to accept or not to accept some uh, petitions. And we, our work is focused on constitutional issues. So the judicial work of our court is uh, to examine the, 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 the cases under the Constitution, the Constitution. But in our history, uh, the Supreme Court uh, have uh, uh, a role, very, a very narrow role in the institutional uh, arena in Argentina during the history, because uh, the people uh, on the earth didn't know which are the judges and and perhaps. The, the existence of the, of, the Supreme, of the Supreme Court. This is very different from the US. In the last uh, 10 years, um, we tried to change the institutional position of the Supreme Court. When we arrived to this position, I try to um, uh, participate in the public agenda very, in a very strong way and to establish some kind of interaction of power, different branch of powers. And this is uh, perhaps the most important shift in our uh, history because the court nowadays is very well known by all the people of our country and our, our judges are very known. Uh, we have a very strong relationship with uh, the court and the society and uh, the, the relationship within the, within the court and the university system and all the the lawyers, it's a very, very strong relationship. 
um, we also had a very um, a, a, a st a strong steps uh, along the same kind of activism, very different from the, the our compositions in our history. So we have a lot of decision where our court, um, uh, for example, in environmental law, we in, we have a, a lot of decision um, abandoning self-restraint and saying to our branch of powers, mainly the executive power, you have to act uh, in in the environmental field. This is the same in in the field of social rights. Uh, for example, the uh, right to access to, um, to, to, to food, to water, the access to uh, uh, a, a lot of decisions uh, in, 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 to labor, a lot of decisions in, in the field of social rights. Um, in, this is very controversial because, uh, as you can understand, the other branch of powers are very re reactive. When the judicial branch uh, have uh, this kind of decisions, but we have a strong uh, position on social rights and environmental rights and also in the field of um, um, human rights uh, because we declared the unconstitutionality of the amnesty law. So we open uh, perhaps the most important process uh, in our region and perhaps in the world because we have nowadays a thousand of trials where um, judges are uh, uh, only respecting the due process, but they are um, analyzing the responsibility of uh, a lot of people during our dictatorships in the, in the 70s. So 30 years later, but uh, we declare the unconstitutionality of the amnesty law, the presidential pardon, and so we open the door, and we are managing all the all the all the trials along the the countries. This is in the field of human rights. We also have. Uh, lot of decision of in the field of uh, freedom of expression um, and generally speaking we we open the door to um, not only the, the possibility to express critics we protect the journalist position uh, in the case uh, here under our court, we protected uh, the, the, the journalist position and his right to, to critics, uh, judges, and also um, using the, the US uh, jurisprudence in, in this case. But we also uh, established that uh, there are some limits in, in, in the um, faculties of the executive power to give or not to give financial assistance to media. This is also very controversial in our relationship with the executive power. Um, this is in the field of uh, human rights, generally speaking, but uh, our position nowadays is very 
very strong, I think, uh, because the people support the court. This is why we had uh, the, the last year uh, very hard times, very hard times because the, the executive power promoted a very, uh, very wide reform in the judicial system and our court declared this law unconstitutional and this was very, very, very hard and was uh, some kind of crisis. But uh, uh, we think that the people support the court and nowadays we are here. <laughs> and I think that uh, historically speaking it's a big change because we, we passed through a, a court with, a, with a, a very narrow and perhaps a very low profile to a court with a very high profile and very active, mm -hmm. and not only active, proactive, because we are uh, proposing um, some issues to the society to discuss and to promote discussion in the society. This is perhaps a, a general, a speak, generally speaking, is uh, our our position nowadays. Mm. Some some questions. Actually, maybe I could just begin. Uh, in our discussions with some of the civil society groups, uh, they said that um, the Supreme Court has become uh, much more independent of the executive, and you know that that's a very good thing and a very good change. But that many of the lower court uh, lower courts are still quite politicized, and I wonder if you um, agree with that, and whether there's some remedy for that. Uh, uh, you know, to make them more truly independent, because it sounds like there are many cases of corruption in the executive branch that never they get revealed, but there's never a prosecution because it's too easy for the government to simply remove the prosecutor or uh, the judge in the case. Yes, I agree. I agree with that. But uh, I think uh, this is a very uh, controversial issue and very complex. First of all, it's true. <laughs> but, uh, which is the solution? It's true in a lot of countries, in a lot of countries. Uh, um, for example, uh, we have a strong relationship with uh, judicial powers in, our, in a lot of countries in the US. Uh, when George Bush uh, finished uh, his presidency, I was talking about how can you judge him about their violations, violation on human rights and international treaties. Um, a federal judge said to me, we don't. This is not our tradition. Well, I respect that. But in Argentina, um, we need to improve the position of the federal judges. The problem is that the court is very different in this, uh, in this issue from the U.S. Supreme Court, because uh, the U.S. Supreme Court have a lot of faculties in the regulatory field to to um, make changes, but we don't have. We are very limited uh, to the judicial work, and we don't have uh, the possibility to change uh, how the federal judges are working. Because in the 90s, we had uh, constitutional amendment. And this was very, very incredible because we have a constitution 
following the U.S. constitutional advice, but in the 90s, uh, the amendment introduced an institution from Europe. This is uh, the uh, Consejo de la Magistratura. And this institution is that uh, uh, have all the power to regulate, to accuse judges, to regulate their works, and this is uh, not our possibility. Um, we are always trying to suggest that uh, we need to change uh, these issues, and not only on the federal, at the federal level, it's the same problem at the state level, because we have uh, a lot of uh, state uh, judiciary powers where the, it's the same problem. But it's not general, no? I think that uh, we have very good judges also. Thank you. Uh, uh, you mentioned briefly uh, the example of um, the Supreme Court uh, telling the executive that their use of advertising funds um, has been discriminatory to media based on sort of their political persuasion. How have things been changing um, since you made that decision as far as how the government is spending their advertising dollars? Do you see a change? Um, the court, uh, when we have a case here, we have uh, a special um, decision of a case, but the execution is made by, by, by the lower courts. We don't know how it is the, the execution nowadays. Um, perhaps if you ask the civil society or some NGOs, they must, uh, perhaps they can complain because the executive power is not uh, following our decisions in that uh, field. But I think it is also a problem of uh, the lawyers, because uh, when you have uh, a decision of the court, in the lower court, you have a lot of uh, remedies. And I don't know, uh, we have three cases. In one of these cases, in a, in a state, in a Rio Negro state, the problem was solved. The parties uh, agree and the solution. This is, uh, the f it, it was the first case. The other ones, uh, the other was Perfil, uh, I, I don't know how is uh, the case nowadays in, because it's in the lower court and the, and the last one was Artear, uh, is uh, this year, uh, I don't know. But um, uh, I think that uh, um, we have a lot of remedies in our system. And the party has to use that. Thank you very much, Dr. Lodenzetti. I was wondering, we, we, some of the people we've met with here have talked about the kind of problems with corruption cases in, in the court system that often it's taking 12 years to get to a verdict and that often the verdicts are not guilty of innocence. And so it seems that there's an issue in the courts of actually dealing or addressing corruption in a serious and credible manner. So I wanted to hear from your vantage point what you see as the problem and how, what might be some steps to address it to more effectively combat <coughs> corruption in the courts. Thank you. Um, well, I I just say that uh, the problem is um, that we have uh, a different institution. We don't have the possibility to establish rules in, in that field. We, we don't have the, 
the possibility to um, uh, to, to to take decisions that uh, uh, affect the independence of other judges, but the Consejo de la Magistratura have they have the possibility to accuse and they have the possibility to establish regulatory uh, systems to to make uh, to add more transparency um, but uh, this is a very complex institution and highly politicized this is, in my opinion, the problem. I think uh, th this is a very, very bad change. When you have a constitutional system, you need coherence. Uh, we have a system uh, following the US institution, but uh, uh, the difference is nowadays that we don't have a Supreme Court with regulatory power, we don't have uh, financial autonomy, and we don't have the possibility to um, educate in, in, the edu in the capacity building, we don't have any kind of possibility that you have in the US. So. The, Conse the Consejo de la Magistratura is an institution from Europe. Um, it's an uh, institution that works um, under other umbrella, under other system. And uh, it's, first of all, it took a lot, of, a lot of time to put some coherence because the an institution coming from other system. Um, also, we have a lot of problem because in, the, in you have in Europe a parliamentary system, and here we have a very different system. And it's, I think it's, it's a very bad change. When you mix, you lose coherence, and it's very it's highly politicized. Uh, we don't have the possibility to act. But I think the good uh, aspect is that uh, we are assisting to a lot of public pressure under uh, this issue, over this issue, and, uh, and I think over the, the, the Consejo de la Magistratura. Uh, we try to um, to when you when we have a case, we try to uh, improve this, this trends. For example, yesterday we have uh, we had a decision that uh, obliged to the executive power to give more more transparency uh, and access to public information. Well, we try, but uh, we don't have uh, jurisdiction over the, the federal judges. This is a problem. My question is uh, on the subject of transparency and access to information, uh, as you just described. Um, it seems a, a trend that we've been hearing is that there's not a high public demand for transparency and access to information like we have in the United States. I'm, I'm curious if you think that there is a public demand, and if there's not, is that inhibiting and preventing um, accountability and uh, preventing corruption? Excuse me, but I, I, can you explain more of your, your position? Sure. In, in the United States, we have a, a very high public demand for transparency yes. and access to information. But as we've been hearing throughout the week, there's, there's not that same demand for transparency and access to information in Argentina. And I'm wondering if, if that's true from your perspective, and if it is true, but you, is it in the are, are you referring to the society? 
And I think, uh, no, 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 I agree. I think the society is uh, now, nowadays, we have a lot of pressure from the society for more transparency and, and open government. And for example, in our court, we have a program uh, focus on open government. We publish everything, all our decisions, not only judicial decisions, but uh, uh, decision in, in, uh, in the administrative field. All the decisions are published, and we have uh, we opened. Uh, the web to people to to present petitions. This is a program of open government. We also have um, a program focus on um, long-term policies. Uh, last this week, uh, I, I gave a lecture to all uh, 200 uh, students that assist in here, uh, the best students from all the universities from all over the countries, uh, they assist us physically and we had a um, connection online uh, with all the universities. Um, we work every month, I give a, a lecture, from an a specific uh, long-term issues, mainly focus on, um, we, we call it uh, um, political uh, um, policies, form of political policies. And we encourage all the students, the most qualified students, to make proposal, and they interact with us so we have a strong relationship with, with uh, people here. But it's not the same in, in other fields, and in executive power, for example. But uh, we have a federal executive power and state executive powers. And I think we, we are trying to say, well, this is the, the way we work, and we would like that you follow the same, the same way, but this, we can't uh, oblige. Uh, in, of course, we have judicial decisions, but uh, I think the, the demand from the society is very, very high. Nowadays, uh, my question is about the um, newly opened trials for crimes in the military tribunals. How have you confronted or how has the court confronted the issues with trying 30-year-old cases in terms of evidence and things like that? And do you find that this, or do you think that this delayed justice model is a good model for other countries uh, that have had similar experiences? Military tribunals. The, the trials about the crime yeah. committed during the military government. Because we declare unconstitutional a law that submits these issues to military tribunal. This is my, because I asked you. Well, we, um, I think that uh, in this field, that perhaps we can call it uh, transitional justice. Every country have uh, their, their own experience and, and the social changes are very different and the political changes and the, and the institutional framework and we must respect this. It's not the same here and for example in South Africa. It's not the same. Um, in South Africa, they had a good solution, it works. Uh, we are not an example to follow. It's, it's, uh, it's very different, and I think that uh, 
uh, every country have uh, a history and a context and the solution uh, must be analyzed inside uh, this context. In our case, uh, also you have uh, to take into account that it was a long process. Um, after uh, the finish of the dictatorship, we have a first period during Alfonso presidency. Uh, I think uh, in that period uh, they faced uh, a very hard time because uh, there was a lot of attempts to reestablish the dictatorship. So the decision to open a trial in that time uh, was very it was very important. Uh, but after that, we declare unconstitutional um, amnesty law and the par presidential pardon. This is a, a very strong decision, but we have an inter-American system on human rights. And under this umbrella is understandable, because it's very different from other countries. Um, so after that, we face uh, a second stage, because uh, it's very hard to manage a lot of trials in every state. And this trial focused on issues uh, for 30 years ago. So we uh, create here uh, a commission to um, manage, focus on or organizational issues. Uh, so how to, um, to help judges to find, uh, for example, some difficult uh, proofs. We have, uh, for example, in, in Tucuman state, in it's a province, we had the uh, detention center where they detected uh, a hole where they throw people, uh, where we help to to find the medical support and mechanical instruments to go through the the hole. And it's, it's very hard, but we establish a commission um, between the th the three branch of power to help judges. And this is the way it works nowadays and we it's working good. It's working good. Sir, thank you, Todd. The uh, question would be based on your comments, are there any legislative movements to adjust the powers of the court uh, to amend? You've mentioned a couple times that the court, the difference between the U.S. system and your system is at this time, is there any legislation to, to amend some of those powers to give you the judicial system uh, more flexibility and regulatory power? No, no. Um, I think that uh, the other branch of, of power are not interested in. And I think this is a problem in a lot of countries, as we know. We are, nowadays, uh, we are in a different world than in the 90s, uh, because uh, when the, the, our constitution were devised, it was very different. Um, I think that we have, nowadays, an statute of power in our constitution that uh, it, it doesn't work with the reality, because uh, um, is, is focus all the the governments is focused on elections and not in the in long term issues 
not in the next generations. And nobody had the incentives to impose burdens or sacrifices on their constituency nowadays, promising benefits in the long term. This is why this kind of issue, long-term issues, constitutional questions, are posing in our society by non-orthodox players. Uh, this is why I believe that we must open access to justice, to improve civil society, to empower NGOs, they don't depend on elections. Um, this is why I believe in uh, the role of Supreme Courts to act in this field because we don't depend on elections. And this is why in a lot of countries courts are acting very strong in social rights, in environmental rights, in a lot of issues, discrimination. Uh, they are non-orthodox players in terms of the estatute power uh, we have. Uh, and the other question is, uh, is uh, in our system, is uh, the government is uh, mainly focused on reaction. They have a problem, they react. But we need uh, proactive governance. And, for example, on environmental issues. This is uh, the role that they can develop nowadays. We, you, you can find nowadays uh, in Argentina and in a lot of countries um, uh, people uh, in, in executive powers that are thinking uh, systematically in, in terms of systemic terms that we have a lot of parts that put in relationship to uh, make some equilibrium in the long term is impossible for them. So this is our uh, position nowadays. We are um, thinking in, in, in a system uh, with a lot of relationship. This is why the courts nowadays have, are playing a role that the executive power are not playing. And I, I think it's a big change in the uh, constitution perhaps not in a constitutional device, but in the way that our uh, democracy works. In, not only in Argentina, I think in a lot of countries. Dr. Dr. Lorenz, maybe I could follow up on that. In terms of the economic and social rights in the Constitution, um, one problem with having the courts intervene on those issues is that they're not very good at making budgets, you know, uh, uh, and, and usually um, fulfilling those rights requires balancing resource allocations, you know, to things like housing or education, health, versus, you know, the realities of, of um, uh, the, the country's fiscal situation. So I, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, about how you see the, what do you think the appropriate rule of the courts is in, in, in that area. Yes. Uh, well, as you know, it's, it's very controversial, but um, um, we have nowadays uh, three positions. The first one is uh, self-restraint. Uh, for example, in the, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Supreme Court is very convinced that, well, we have a parliament, we have to decide it. Mm -hmm. uh, in the other stream, you have the Indian Supreme Court. I've been in India last week, 
and we are very interested in that, how, how they are working because they order not only uh, uh, to make a plan but uh, they intervene in how the plan is implemented and they are very overburdened mm -hmm. nowadays and mm -hmm. they have they are facing a lot of problem of not only of causing problem budget budgetary problem but uh, problem of how uh, how a court can manage a lot of case cases and the, the expectations mm -hmm. so we are in, in our court we are in a position that um, we we need to have some kind of uh, of comments first of all we have a constitution very different from the US because we have social rights and human rights in at constitutional level we can ignore it uh, if you have a right you need a remedy uh, when you have a petition you have to order but we are not uh, convinced of self-restraint or very uh, very active in the, in a way that you can uh, go beyond the, the division of powers so in a lot of cases we had uh, um, a procedural uh, attitude. So we say there is a right, social rights for example, or environmental rights, uh, you are not um, fulfilling this right in the way the constitution established, so our decision is uh, provide a solution to this right. How is the solution is your problem because you have the constitutional uh, faculty to, to manage the, the budget. If you don't have budget, you need to provide a solution also. So, we have a different uh, ways. For example, uh, in some decisions, um, um, for example, in the field of pensions for all people, we have a different system from the U.S. But uh, we uh, establish a mandate to Congress because uh, we say, well, uh, all the people uh, have rights to uh, a minimal pension in in. Well, uh, the Congress must discuss it. Mm -hmm. This is a way. Mm -hmm. We call it exhortative mm -hmm. decisions mm -hmm. to the Congress, mandates to the Congress. This is uh, when, when you have uh, a very broad uh, political issue and involves uh, macroeconomics mm -hmm. mainly. When you have a decision uh, with um, with, a, with an only case, but we suspect that the consequences will be very important. We have here, we created here a unit of economic analysis mm -hmm. for the economic consequences. We have a, uh, an opinion from this uh, unit of economic analysis. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of ways, but uh, it's very important. Mm -hmm. Well, we're conscious of your time, and we're really appreciative that you've taken uh, this much time to uh, be with us. We have a little gift for you from Stanford. Oh, thank you.